what I'll do in this lesson is talk about theories of presidential power. So we've talked in previous lessons about um, different aspects of the executive branch of government. We've been talking about the president, uh, sorry, the constitutional powers of the president, the restrictions that are placed upon the president by other uh, branches of government, for example, Congress or the Supreme Court. And we also talked about other institutions within the executive branch. So looking at the cabinet, for example. Well, in this lesson, we're going to talk about a, a more political theory, talk about the kind of theories of presidential power that exist, and then some of the evidence to support the different theories of presidential power. So we're going to namely be focusing on the distinction between the idea of an imperial theory of presidential power versus the imperiled theory of presidential power. So is the president and can we show that the office of the president is uh, increasingly more imperial in nature or increasingly more imperiled in nature? And we'll explain what both these mean uh, later on. And then we'll also use a lot of examples to try and come to some kind of conclusion as to uh, where we really stand on this issue. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to examine the evidence of both theories as well. So let's begin with the imperial presidency, the concept of the imperial presidency. What does this actually mean? Well, ultimately... It was a concept that was first coined by a, a writer in the 1970s uh, known as Arthur um, Schlesinger. And uh, it was really a term used to describe, or at least was in response to, the Nixon presidency. And if you know anything about your US history, you will know that um, Richard Nixon was uh, did a number of, let's say, controversial things while in office. And we'll talk about a few of them in this video. But ultimately, this was a coined phrase that was in response to the kind of actions that were uh, taking place under the Nixon presidency. And ultimately, the concept of this idea that the presidency is an imperial, um, is becoming increasingly more imperial, is effectively the, uh, the theory that the president has become um, uh, more emperor-like, if you will. So dominating Congress, um, controlling Congress in a lot more uh, egregiously, uh, conducting um, foreign policy almost entirely on their own. Um, these kinds of things effectively becoming almost like a little dictator uh, within, the, within the US state. And Effectively, this such a theory, if we were to conclusively come to a, uh, a kind of um, conclusion, if you will, about whether or not the president is imperial or not, this would be an unconstitutional um, expansion of the president's power. So when we are talking about a number of pieces of evidence to support this theory, a number of these things are arguably um, unconstitutional, or at least uh, fly in the face of the proposed idea of what the president was supposed to be according to the Constitution, and obviously according to the Founding Fathers. On the other hand, we have the concept of the imperiled presidency, which is just the other side of the coin, effectively. And this is a, ultimately a response to the imperial presidency theory, and it was... Um, a phrase coined by Gerald Ford, who was a president, one of the presidents, um, but not particularly um, too influential within US history. And he suggested that the presidency was more imperiled. And this is a phrase used to suggest that presidential power is incredibly weak, um, that it is ineffective, and it ultimately that we have an aggressive, um, overbearing Congress that controls uh, the presidency and ultimately blocks the president and, you know, does a number of things that would um, signify that the power of the president is relatively weak or relatively lacking. So we have these two theories, two ideas of where the president sits in terms of the president's power. And I think it should be ought to be uh, made clear at the start that there is no one theory that is um, true for, for every president. If we take if we look back at least to the uh, since the Second World War, uh, look at all the presidents that we've had since the Second World War, you would notice that there are examples where we see a president that is um, more on the imperiled side of the uh, of the spectrum. So, for example, um, uh, Gerald Ford, um, Jimmy Carter, um, even Obama to an extent. Uh, and we'll talk about that later. And then we can look at the more imperial sides, more, uh, presidents that seem to be exerting more force and authority um, than their office deems necessary. So people like Nixon, people like Ronald Reagan. Um, you could argue that George W. Bush or uh, Donald Trump, President Trump, were uh, all examples of this. And so we can see that this is a, a theory that goes back and forth. We can have examples where we have quite a weak president and then quite a strong overbearing president. 
So let's begin with the imperial presidency theory. Let's let's look at some evidence for this. Well, as stated above, the imperial theory of the president was a first t- uh, used was a, a term that was first coined um, to explain the Nixon presidency. So you can probably understand that we have quite a bit of evidence to suggest that Nixon was uh, arguably a quote unquote imperial president. And so we can talk about things such as the authorization of military intervention in Cambodia and Laos without congressional approval. So this was a um, a thing that Nixon did uh, in response to the Vietnam conflict and ultimately expanded the Vietnam conflict into Laos and Cambodia. And really, the continuation of the Vietnam War was also a good example of Nixon's imperial presidency theory. And while you can make that claim that Nixon definitely continued the um, continued the president, uh, sorry, the 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 conflict in Vietnam and expanded it into Cambodia and Laos, we do have to also make clear that you could argue this for a lot of presidents. The the Vietnam War took place over, uh, over I believe, five presidents and um, presidents of both political parties. You have Kennedy, you have um, LBJ, Lyndon B. Johnson, you have Nixon, um, you have Ford, um, and you could argue to an extent before Kennedy that the the intervention within that region of the world was also something done, done by um, Eisenhower. So we can see that if you want to talk about the, the power of the presidency over foreign policy, the, then you should really be looking to at things such as the Vietnam conflict. In 1972, we also saw the Watergate scandal, which showed the power of the Nixon presidency, or at least showed the... Um, or at least highlighted the corruption of the Nixon presidency. This was a plan on breaking into the Democratic offices, the I believe it was the Democratic National uh, Convention, uh, and ultimately trying to um, s- steal election um, secrets effectively. And this was known as the um, Watergate scandal because it was uh, took place at the Watergate Hotel. Now, you could argue on the other hand to this that the Watergate scandal shows the kind of corruption that took place under the Nixon presidency. It shows the kind of um, where Nixon believed he was in terms of how much power he had. But you can then also make the counter argument to suggest that even though the Watergate scandal was obviously a very um, egregious showing of corruption, uh, it ultimately failed since it, it forced Nixon out of office. He had to resign before he was impeached. Now, we can also move on and talk about other presidents uh, from um, since Nixon. You can talk about, for example, uh, ultimately every single president since 1941 has at some point um, used some kind of military intervention uh, around the world in some, in some way. And we should note that from when we were studying the Constitution, it should be Congress that declares war. And so it's been since 1941 there has not been a formal declaration of war by Congress, despite the fact that we can think of countless examples of military intervention abroad by um, US presidents. So you can talk about the conflict in Korea, you can talk about Vietnam, Cambodia, you can talk about Laos, you can talk about um, the Gulf War, so the first uh, Iraq conflict, you can talk about Iraq and Afghanistan, you can talk about Libya. Um, We can talk about a lot of different um, things relating to military intervention. You can talk about Syria. So these are all different examples of military intervention that took place post-1941 without any formal declaration of war by Congress. And so it shows that within the field of foreign policy, the president has at least expanded their power um, to an extent. We can also talk about specific examples of um, specific presidents doing um, arguably imperial things. So Post 9-11, the, the 9-11 terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center, uh, President George W. Bush um, used this, uh, used this uh, terrorist attack as ultimately a mandate to expand the power of the presidency. Now, this is not me suggesting some kind of conspiracy that he used the 9-11 specifically with that intention. But ultimately what happened was, since 9-11, um, George W. Bush had expanded the power of the president under the remit, under the umbrella of this conflict that he described as the war on terror. And we can see some uh, examples of this. So, for example, uh, the invasion of Iraq and, uh, and Afghanistan and also the establishment of the Guantanamo Bay uh, Detention Center in Cuba, which uh, obviously detained people without their, um, w- without their, ultimately without their rights. Now, continuing on, looking at further evidence of an imperial president theory, um, Obama and Trump also showed examples of their imperial presidency. Now, Obama less so and, and Trump more so. 
So the, one example of this would be uh, Obama not seeking congressional approval for a 2011 military intervention in Libya. And then if we're talking about Donald Trump, we have a number of different examples of his extension of presidential power. So, for example, um, under the uh, under the President Trump, the amount of executive orders that took place um, was substantial. There was a huge increase in the number of executive orders under his only only under his single term in office. Now, on the other hand, we have some examples of the imperiled presidency theory. So, for example, the increasing military intervention that took place um, within Korea and Vietnam um, forced Congress to pass the War Powers Act. Now, ultimately, the War Powers Act was a piece of legislation that was designed to prevent the ability of the president... Um, to use military action without congressional approval. Now, the extent to which this was a successful um, a limitation on the president's power is debatable because we have still, despite the fact that we have the 1973 War Powers Act, we still have seen a lot of examples of the president um, authorising military intervention in different areas of the world. Now, a very good example that I would argue is one of the best examples of the imperiled presidency theory is shown in the ability for Congress to block the actions that were proposed by Obama. Don't forget, following the 2010 midterms, uh, the Republican Party retook both the House and the Senate and as such made the, uh, effectively Obama became what we would describe as a, quote, lame duck president, somebody who um, effectively can't do anything, has no authority um, within the office. And a good example of this was in 2016 when the Senate blocked any attempt by Obama to uh, appoint a new Supreme Court justice. Obama wanted to appoint uh, Merrick Garland, who I believe is the Secretary of State uh, currently under Biden. And ultimately, um, uh, or, 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 sorry, you may... I believe it, or maybe the Attorney General, Secretary of State or the Attorney General. Ultimately, though, um, uh, the Supreme Court refused to allow even a hearing on, um, sorry, the uh, Senate refused to allow even a hearing on uh, the appointment of Merrick Garland, arguing that it was in bad taste or at least, uh, you know, not right to have a, a Supreme Court justice appointment um, so close to the presidency. This was nine months to the, uh, before the uh, election, the presidential elections. Finally, we can talk about the uh, the conflict that began to um, take place between Congress and the Trump administration when the uh, Republican Party lost the House in 2018 midterms. The Trump administration um, got into quite a uh, kerfuffle, if you will, uh, when it came to the funding of the border wall, his proposed border wall in the in the annual budget. And it led to a government shutdown. And this was actually the longest government shutdown in history. So we have an example here of the Trump administration being quite limited in their ability to do anything um, because of the power that Congress had over uh, the financial aspects of the state.